We've talked previously about the freedoms of aviation, or the nine rules that govern the privileges of international air travel. While most of the world has seen most of these essentially go away, they're still very prevalent in Africa, with many connecting and foreign operating flights. Across a number of airlines, there's no shortage of examples, like Malabo to Lagos, Ouagadougou to Accra, Douala to Libreville, Nouakchott to Conakry, Dakar to Bamako, Dakar to Banjul, Dakar to Freetown, the list just continues to go on and on. Today's, however, will take us on the shortest wide-body flight in the entire world, so short that all it does is cross the Congo River, from Brazzaville of the Republic of Congo to Kinshasa of the Democratic Republic of Congo, two cities that are only 5 miles or 8 kilometers and a flight only taking about 10 minutes, operated by an Air France 777. Welcome to the Sheraton Charles de Gaulle Airport Hotel located right inside the airport's train station, so it's only a short walk to Terminal 2E, where most of Air France's non-Schengen flights operate from. Terminal 2 is by far the largest terminal at Charles de Gaulle, although it's broken down into a bunch of subsections labeled by letter. 2E, for example, where we are, which is also the largest section of Terminal 2, and is also broken down even further into three wings, K, L, and M. There's a specific entrance for Sky Priority passengers, which applies to Sky Team customers in premium economy, business, and first class, as well as Sky Team status holders. Once inside the door, the first thing we see is the specific Sky Priority check-in area for Air France passengers. It's broken down a bit further to those traveling Sky Priority due to status and Sky Priority due to the ticket that they're holding, and then broken down into destination as flights to the United States have an extra special part of the Sky Priority check-in area. Right next to that is the ultra-exclusive La Première First Class Check-In, my next ultimate bucket list item that I don't know when I'll actually be able to try it out. As mentioned, the Sky Priority Check-In area seemed to be split into four groups. We headed off to the Business Class Check-In area for non-US flights, got our boarding pass, checked our bag, and continued on towards immigration. All said and done, the check-in process only took about 10 minutes. There's a special exit out the back of the Sky Priority area and from there it's only a short walk around the corner to reach the outbound immigration. Paris's immigration is infamously slow and tedious, but fortunately there is a specific area for Sky Priority passengers with a separate entrance off to the side. The line was much shorter, especially since it was still early at about 6am, but because there was only a single agent working the stand, it still took about half an hour to get through still better than it probably would have otherwise. Once through immigration, we saw security for the K-Gates, the closest wing connected to the 2E hub. To get to the satellites L and M, we have to hop on the tram located directly adjacent to the security. We're out to the M-Gates, which are the main gates for Air France's long-haul flights with the ability to accommodate around 16 aircraft. As we rode out to the M gates, a roughly five minute journey, I realized that on the checked bag tags and boarding passes, there was no sign of Brazzaville anywhere, only on the flight status boards, unless you were actually getting off in Brazzaville. Off the train in the M gates, we head upstairs where we reach the security for us, the M gate security. It took about 10 minutes getting through the sky priority lane. This means that from the entrance of the terminal to the M gates, it was a total of roughly an hour. Keep in mind, however, that this is at the early hours of the day, a couple hours before the first departure has even left these gates, so plan accordingly if you maybe have a midday or early afternoon departure. The M gates have a main hub where you'll find most of the shops and food. They also have these great kiosks that by scanning your boarding pass can show you exactly how to get to your boarding gate along with any other points of interest that you'd like to find within the terminal. Off that central hub, there's about 10 gates to the left and 10 to the right. Both hallways look about the same, with similar decorations. Prior to this, my only experience at CDG was in Terminal 2B for my JetBlue video. I mentioned that it was one of the more beautiful terminals I'd ever seen. While this one doesn't quite match that completely, it is still a pretty good looking terminal. 
As an added bonus, there's also an art museum exhibit set up, although closed at this hour. And as you can see, the other side of the M gates with the other 10 gates seem to resemble the first side almost to a T. Right between the two wings of gates is where we come across this salon lounge, Air France's lounge here in the M gates. It may not be their biggest and newest. That title belongs to the L gate lounge, which was recently renovated and looks incredible. But this one is still a wonderful place to spend some time. Having opened about 10 years ago, there are spaces for all kinds of travelers, whether it be a big group or solo travelers, overnight connections or quick layovers. Down the hallway, you can scan your boarding passes at the self-serve kiosks or with one of the agents at the desk. The lounge is really a grand space. Makes sense since most of their flagship flights do depart from this wing of Charles de Gaulle. Within the lounge, first off, you'll find five large seating areas with all different types of seats, seats for groups and solo travelers alike. There's also no shortage of charging ports as you go throughout as well, so you can be assured that when you get on your flight, both you and your devices are plenty charged. There is also a dedicated work area where there were only a couple people actually working. Most people were just sitting there eating. There's a relaxation area where there were lounging chairs. There were a couple people in here, presumably people who were in the terminal overnight and that just entered when the lounge opened at 5 and wanted a little bit of sleep before getting on their flight. There is an area with quick grab snacks. It isn't the main dining area, which we will see later, but this one does have a little bit of food and some tables for people wanting to sit and eat something little. There is a kids area, including some video games and space for playing and getting out some energy before a long flight. There are showers and a Clarence Spa that supposedly has 20 minute free facials for passengers, but I wasn't able to get in there during my stay today. Wherever you are in the lounge, however, there is plenty of seating near the windows. So if you do want a spot to sit and watch those early morning arrivals into Charles de Gaulle's runways, you can go ahead and grab one of these seats, which I did after getting some food shortly. The biggest section of the lounge was definitely the restaurant, or so they call it. It had a whole lot more food selection than the snack area. It had one counter with food, and the other just across from it with drinks. I will say that the breakfast in most lounges tends to be the least special. Lunches, and especially dinners, seem to have much more creative and signature foods. So without much surprise, the buffet began with bacon and eggs, followed by the somewhat European staple of cold cuts and cheese. Just past that is where you'll find the yogurt and fruit with pancakes. Right in the middle, between the two sides of the buffet, is an island counter of breads and pastries with jams between them. On the counter along the wall, we find the drinks. There's a fairly large fridge with soft drinks and also some strangely placed cereal bins. There's also a counter that houses the coffee machine along with the tea choices and some small cookies to go with it. And lastly, was a section for the alcohol with spirits on the counter and soft drinks and mixers in the fridge below. Just past the buffet was the main dining area. Here, there was a setup that was much better suited for dining, with all seats having a table or surface in front of them, as opposed to next to or between them. Although in all honesty, most people took their food back to a seat within the rest of the lounge, regardless of the location of the table. The lounge was still fairly empty at this point, as it had only been open for a couple hours, and the first departure of the day from this terminal was still not for another hour or so. As we got closer to the flight, it definitely filled up, but I wouldn't say that it was overcrowded. There were still seats in groups of fours available around the lounge. I took a seat by the window before it got too busy. The table was off to the side, but still large enough for a good breakfast considering I skipped lunch and dinner before bed, so I was plenty hungry for breakfast. This stop also gave me a good view of the sunrise and some of the early morning arrivals. About 15 minutes before our boarding was scheduled to begin, I made the adventure out to our gate today, Mike 43. Walking throughout the terminal, we could see a bunch of Delta and Air France aircraft at their gates, including the A350s, which I think is the best airframe that Air France's paint looks best on. 
As a matter of fact, our gate was the only one without a U.S. departure, with flights leaving for San Francisco, Boston, Raleigh, Houston, and more. That was when I returned to our gate so I would be ready to board once the crew was ready for us. We can clearly see that the destination is labeled as Brazzaville, with Kinshasa in the subtext, as this was the only sign of an intermediate stop at Brazzaville for myself and the other Kinshasa-bound passengers. It was there at the gate that I got the first look at our aircraft today, a 777-300ER that has lived its entire life with France for a little over 19 years. Finally, they allowed us through the automated boarding gates and down the boarding hall. There, we reached another stopping point. We initially began boarding at 9.30, and here you can see my watch showing a bit over a half hour from there. We stood here for about 45 minutes just waiting. Not quite sure why, but eventually they let us continue on board. Now, Air France is about as infamous as Qatar is for equipment swaps. On the 777 alone, Seat Guru has seven different configurations. This one is in one of their higher density, but less space for premium seats. Not just that, but it's in a 232 setup, as opposed to their more common 121 configuration on their newer or more recently renovated aircraft. It seems like this plane mostly makes shorter flights, mostly within Africa or smaller Caribbean destinations, typically around seven hour flights. That being said, in the week before my flight, it flew to San Francisco and Seattle. Both are considered fairly far for Air France's route network, and would be disappointing considering both typically see a 121 configuration, so you figure that's probably what people are expecting to find. I'm in seat 3A, where I did end up with a seatmate in 3C. Every seat in business class was occupied on this flight, and to make the welcome extra sweet, I was super grateful to see a note for each passenger. I don't read French, but it looks like it's from the purser. Looking around the seat starting with the center console, on the front of the console we have the charging ports, one universal and one USB, although the USB port never worked for me on this flight. There's a little counter on top of the console split in two leaving a bit for each passenger, but not too much to hold a whole lot. And then below that is the tray table, stored in the side of the center console, as is common for these side-by-side -side seat configurations. It pulls out and is an average size, but unfortunately it's a little less sturdy than the average ones. But I guess that's to be expected of a tray table this old. I'm not sure if it's original with the aircraft or not, but it could be over 19 years old. Back on top of the center console is the seat adjustments where we have presets for seated, resting, and laying. There's also buttons that can be held to slowly progress the recline of the seat, but nothing to move pieces individually. The center armrest is slightly padded, but mostly guards the remote for the seatback TV, which can pop out with the push of a button in order to control the TV in a relaxed position. Below that is a bit of storage. There's a water bottle pocket and a larger pocket with a worn out elastic strap to hold things in. If you use this spot though, be careful that things don't slide out and end up under your seat. Behind that, you've got even more storage in a little cubby behind the armrest. Above that is a reading light that can be aimed around and dimmed by rotating the lens. The headrest is the only part of the seat with the leathery material and is a nice white accent, or at least it was white before it aged. It also can be adjusted for comfort. The seat has a double cushion to try and make it a bit more comfortable, although I found that the age of the cushion had worn it out a bit, and not in the way that makes it feel like a big couch. The other armrest is stationary, but does move up and down as you adjust the seat itself. Above that, there are three windows for each seat. The overhead panel has things weirdly spaced out so your reading light kind of comes from over your shoulder, and there's no air vents. In front of you is a TV screen that's about the size of a modern day economy class TV screen. It's a touch screen as well as remote controlled. Next to it is a coat hook that can be retracted if needed. In between the screens is a hard shell literature pocket which currently just had air sickness bags in them. There's also two larger storage areas below that, one for each seat I presume, and they were a good size, I could fit everything I needed in that spot. There is also a footwell below the TV, and you'll see it's actually fairly wide, the only problem being that it was extremely small height-wise with my feet unable to sit straight up. Under that is a bit of storage, and it's fairly deep, but it had a lip on the floor so I couldn't get my backpack in there, but my shoes fit at least. 
For the amenities we were given, the first was a coat hook, which was able to be customized to put in your seat number. That way, if you had a coat, they could store it and make space for you at your seat. There was also the amenity kit, which came in this awesome little bag. Inside of it, there were some very basic items, including socks, eye mask, and earplugs. The unguarded toothbrush felt a little gross, so I may not be using that at least, though. The amenities themselves were alright, but there was a surprisingly little amount of each item. I really liked the moisturizer, although I only got two uses out of it. It was empty by the time I arrived in Kinshasa. Then the headphones, which have this little tag on it that was basically falling off and didn't really do anything. You figure that they're usually there to hold the cord in, but that didn't seem to be doing that. Speaking of the cord, it's permanently attached to the aircraft, just like it was on my other Air France flight the day before, in a different seat type, so I guess Air France has had a problem with missing headsets. I hope they clean them well enough, but if you're sketched by it, they do have a single prong plug for personal headphones. We were also given our first hot towel of the flight, which was scorching hot, and then pre-departure drinks of the normal choices. Air France's bedding actually keeps it pretty simple. You're given this main comforter blanket type thing, it's not the thickest in the world, but I felt the cabin was kept pretty warm, so it didn't quite matter. In addition to that, you were given a pillow. I did actually think the pillow was great. It was a good size and good firmness, and on the flight I had before, it was plenty for me to get some good sleep. Although this was an all daytime flight, so sleep wasn't necessary on this one. The lavatory was fairly basic for a 19 year old 777. However, one thing that is a major plus is the window directly above the toilet. I love when these bathrooms have windows as it makes the lavatory feel more than just a little white box on an airplane. In addition, Clarence also supplied some perfume and lotion kept in the restroom as well. And as the Air France safety video began playing, and we started our short takeoff out to our departure runway, I'd like to take a moment to mention that I can't place exactly what freedom this operates on. I would say fifth freedom maybe, since it starts in France and then continues to two other countries before returning back. The only thing is that you can't buy a ticket for only the Brazzaville to Kinshasa leg. I'm more tempted to say it's a second freedom operation since Brazzaville serves as more of a technical stop it seems. The only problem against this is that passengers can book either Paris to Brazzaville or Paris to Kinshasa. So even though you can't book the short segment alone, there are passengers getting on and off at the intermediate stop. Let me know your thoughts on what you think this qualifies as, or if you happen to know. Now that we're in the air, a moment to look through the in-flight entertainment system found on this ancient looking Air France business class. Interestingly enough, it actually does have pretty much the same content that you'll find on all the other Air France aircraft, it just looks much, much older. 
With the movies, for example, however, you can see here that just the English movies seem to go on forever. With my finger getting tired of scrolling, I realized I wasn't even halfway through the 81 pages of movies. Part of the reason is because I noticed that there were multiples of some movies. It looked like they were shown in different languages and depending on which one you clicked on depended on which languages you were able to view it in. Fortunately, however, we were able to add things to our favorites to find them later on, although I never quite made it through all of the options. There was also the wellness section, which in English and French had options to help you relax, help you meditate, help you get to sleep, or even help you do yoga exercises that you could do in your seat. The TV options, similarly to movies of course, had all the genres, however, far less selections as you can see there's only 18 pages as opposed to 81 pages of options. In addition, they weren't all in English and each episode was shown separately, so there was really only a few different series available. The comedy section was remarkably small, but I guess kudos to them for not giving in to the Big Bang. After that was looking through the music, where there were different albums under different genres that you could go through. Perhaps the biggest thing is that you could go through and watch all of these video clips and shows of some of the songs. The game section had a remarkable zero options to it. And then the kids section had these three sections of music, movies, and games just meant for kids. The My Flight tab had some interesting things, especially if you were arriving into Paris where you could get information on your arrival and the connecting gates for those that needed to catch a later flight. The map section did have an adjustable map, however it wasn't the most common type of map. It was a little bit of a pain to have to zoom in and move the map using these buttons rather than just dragging your fingers across it like you would on an iPad or phone. I was a fan of having the cameras although I really only was able to use them for about a quarter of the flight. The rest of the flight I just got this black screen. There was a section about Air France which you could use instead of having an Air France in-flight magazine. And then the and more tab mostly was just a space for your USB files if you had been able to connect your own USB media player. I also ended up using the remote most of the time because as you can see here, the touch wasn't exactly the best thing in the world. The remote was definitely easier to manage. The Air France 777s are equipped with Wi-Fi. I found the Wi-Fi to actually be fairly slow on this flight, although it wasn't too bad on my flight from New York to Paris. It does come with an option to see the outage zones along your route as well, along with all of the different plans that can be purchased, in addition to the La Premier passengers being able to access it for free. Then taking a look through the menus given to business class passengers. I do like that Air France customizes these menus for each flight as we can see the Paris to Brazzaville label. It started with a letter from the chef before going on to the pages explaining what would be available for each of the meals. On this flight, we had a lunch service earlier on and a light snack just before arrival, with a couple little bits in the galley throughout the flight. Next was a couple pages explaining the drink options, both the wines, champagnes, and then hard alcohols. Then the non-alcoholic options, the cold drinks and the hot drinks. Our meal service started with this nice little carrot, butternut squash, and hazelnut puree, along with these little cheesy, crunchy snacks. After our little appetizer, we flew past this A320, this one leaving from Paris Orly, going off to Ibiza. After that, however, it was time for the main part of our meal service, so they've made our tables with the tablecloth and brought us the first course of our meal. The first course started with a side salad along with this crab and snow pea dish. Each passenger also got this ginormous baguette to go with their dish. And as always, we have to check up on these silverware. We love when they carve their logos in and Air France did just that. Gotta give them a thumbs up on that. And as we made our way across Algeria and then into Africa, we finally got the main course. For my main course, I went with the shrimp, ginger, and lemongrass sauce, came with orzo pasta with squid ink, and some crunchy vegetables, 
although honestly they were a little more wilted than the menu made it sound. Then he put down the desserts and came by with the tea box so I could take my choosing of which one I wanted. The desserts were nice. I also decided to go with a vanilla Ruibas tea as it's become one of my favorite teas. They also offered us a drink to end the meal. I thought it was a white port, but in all honesty, I've never drank in a port to end a meal, so I could have completely misunderstood him. At this point, I had finished my meal and was left with basically just a bowl of squid ink. We were also crossing the Sahara Desert, and being somewhere that I had never been in the world, I decided to sit back and enjoy the sights before getting my bed fully flat. Now this style of business class is a bit old and strange to see on an airline as prestigious as Air France. Even still, I wanted to play with the seat modes. The presets weren't really working, so instead I had to hold down the arrows to just kind of get it slowly all the way down into the relaxed position, and then finally into the fully flat position. The armrest does go down as the seat lowers, although not completely flush with the seat. The seat gets into what we'll call an angled lie flat, as it's not completely flat. It also is kind of strange that it doesn't fully meet up with the footrest, so you have this little tiny gap between the edge of the seat and the edge of the footrest. With the pillow and the blanket that they hand out, you can fully make the bed. Although it's admittedly far less comfortable than the 1-2-1 setup style that they have on their other 777s. Would be kind of a bummer to be stuck with this on a long haul flight to the west coast of the US. The footwell was wide, like I mentioned before, but it wasn't really tall. So I couldn't really put my feet straight up, I had to keep them bent at an angle or stagger them on my side. I also couldn't really curl my feet up just because they would slip into that gap. Of course, the other drawback of this style is having to do that awkward lunge over the passenger on the aisle if you have to use the lavatory. Filming through the window was actually kinda tough, mostly just because of how dirty the window was. You can see it here when it unfocused. We were finally about three hours from our arrival into Brazzaville. At that point, they came through with the tablecloths to make our tray table one last time for our pre-arrival meal. I gotta say, it was one of my favorite airplane meals. Basically just a sandwich, but with like a puff pastry brioche bun, some garlicky cheese, and also some nice vegetables. After that, we were given our hot towel as we prepared for our arrival into Brazzaville. We were a couple hours from Brazzaville when they came through and passed out the immigration forms. I told them I wasn't getting off, that I was continuing to Kinshasa, but they told me I needed it anyway. Turns out I didn't really need it, and it ended up just getting crumpled up and put at the bottom of my backpack. And as we made our descent, I'll skip through the shots fairly quickly, but there was plenty of thunderstorms that we dodged on the entire way in, in addition to having the sun setting behind our wing made for some beautiful videos, and of course, plenty of turbulence.
Once we had arrived in Brazzaville, there were a small portion of passengers who were planning to deplane in Brazzaville. Those seats were entirely replaced with passengers that would be continuing to Paris after we got off in Kinshasa. For the passengers continuing, we were able to remain on the airplane in our seats. In the meantime, the ground crew came in, cleaned the airplane, restocked the empty seats, and got it ready for departure. We were actually able to see signs of life on the other side of the Congo River, meaning that before we even took off for Kinshasa, we could already see Kinshasa. Now Brazzaville and Kinshasa have actually recently went through upgrades to their airport. Brazzaville in 2010 had a terminal upgrade and a runway upgrade, and in 2013 a further upgrade to the terminal was made as well, helped funded by the Chinese which are doing a lot of investing around Africa, and it can be seen in the building of this current terminal, although unfortunately I was never able to go inside of it on this trip. Kinshasa, similarly, had a new terminal put in in 2015, although looks to be much smaller than what this one is inside. I will say that it was fun having the cabin basically to ourselves for a little while, watching the cabin and flight crew swap out and the ground crew come to clean everything up and restock it before we headed off to our flight. I also enjoyed looking at the map while we waited, seeing that the airports were so close together that even fully zoomed in you could barely even tell that there was a destination and an origin dot on the map. The map showed it as a 14 minute journey from Brazzaville to Kinshasa, longer than what most days had been leading up to this, seeing as low as about 7 minutes, and as high as about 15 minutes. Finally though, they began boarding our flight to Kinshasa, so the timer was about ready to start for the shortest wide body flight in the world. Pushback from the gate began, looking down at my watch, it was just after 7.20 PM. We began our taxi out to the runway. On these airports, rather than having parallel taxiways that run the full length, we end up having to back taxi most of the runway. It was fun, however, to have the cameras working so we could see those runway lights as we rolled down. Just after 7.35, we began our alignment with the runway, turning around at the end, where we sat for a short while before finally taking off at about 7.37. Now rather than getting two videos, one for takeoff and one for landing, I decided to just keep my camera rolling and then time lapse the entire flight later on. It also helped considering the iPhone camera is somewhat infamous for having trouble refocusing at night so I figured while it was focused, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We actually departed to the northeast from Brazzaville and then landed to the southwest in Kinshasa. I'm assuming that two towns five miles apart would have the same weather but maybe the river running between them does affect it. Regardless, it probably doesn't matter too much considering Kinshasa is actually one of the world's largest runways at 15,420 feet or about 4,700 meters. But after mere minutes of nobody getting up, not even the flight attendants from their jump seats, we had begun our final descent into Kinshasa.
So after about 10 or 11 minutes, we had made our way from one side of the Congo River to the other, from Brazzaville to Kinshasa on the world's shortest wide body flight on the Air France 777. You can see here the route that we took to get this done, basically just going out and making a U-turn and coming back in, with a peak altitude of 5,000 feet, of which we were at for maybe a minute. Now the freedoms of air are pretty interesting because they open up aviation markets that wouldn't otherwise be open. For example, Africa takes advantage of these a lot, like Ethiopian Airlines' fifth freedom flight from Addis Ababa to Sao Paulo, continuing to Buenos Aires. They wouldn't have the passenger base to go to Sao Paulo and Buenos Aires, but because of the fifth freedom, they're able to have a continuing flight and get passengers for both destinations using one airplane. Whatever freedom of air this falls into, it's definitely interesting, as any time you can spend this short on this big of an airplane, something special is going on. Now it wouldn't be a complete journey for me if I didn't get at least one remote stand. This was no exception as Kinshasa's airport has no jet bridges. I do like being able to get up close and personal with the airplane you were just flying. However, it is still somewhat of a bummer to have to get on a bus to the terminal. Although I guess everybody at Kinshasa has to do that regardless of where your luck lies. Air France actually has quite a few variations of their business class as mentioned previously. The 121 configuration that I lucked into by upgrade from New York to Paris is much better than what I flew here. You can go ahead and check my Instagram highlights to go see what that one was like. The 232 setup is something that should be retired regardless of airline, but for something as prestigious as Air France, I'm somewhat surprised that it still exists. I'd be curious to see how long this sticks around and how soon they upgrade it, although they do use it on their high density routes since it does allow for more passengers on board. This is where things began getting a bit interesting as we passed through immigration and all gathered around the baggage belt. However, it took a while for bags to start coming out and eventually they came out, stopped, came out, stopped and this kept happening until eventually we finally got our bag. However, we got our bag almost an hour after landing. As a matter of fact, looking at my watch here, it took five times longer for me to just get my suitcase than it did for us to fly from Brazzaville to Kinshasa. Unfortunately, Kinshasa is a city that's riddled with corruption. This is true at the airport especially, but seen throughout the city as well. Just driving to my hotel, the taxi driver rolled up the windows at multiple points of the drive, claiming that it was not safe, telling me that people would jump through the window and steal whatever they could grab before running off. So I guess travel here with caution. Even within the airport, the second I got off the airplane, people were telling me, you give me money, I take you to the front of the immigration line. You give me money, I go get your bag for you. You give me money, I take you to the front of this line. Even the cops guarding the airport wanted 50 US dollars just to let me out of the airport. Fortunately, my taxi driver was persistent enough to grab my arm and take me past them before I got in his car. After spending my couple days in Kinshasa, however, I went back to the airport and finally flew out on Kenya Airways. If you've seen my Kenya Airways video I recently posted from Nairobi to New York, you'll know exactly where I was headed once I left this country. I hope you enjoyed this journey, definitely a unique one, but until next Sunday, safe travels and I'll see y'all next time.